Well, welcome to Valley View this morning. Happy Easter. I want to invite you to do kind of the, the Easter kind of call and return kind of greeting thing where I say, he is risen, and then you respond, he is risen indeed, right? So you know that one. So he is risen. Well, praise the Lord for that. We just want to welcome you here to church. And um, if this is your first time with us, or maybe you're just your first time in a long time, we want to just encourage you to fill a little card. There's a place to do that outside either side of the doors, and um, this will give us a chance to follow up with you and uh, minister to you at whatever needs you might have. We have a small gift we'd like to give you if you do that as well. Um, we did not prepare you for this, but, but uh, Easter Sunday is usually one of the Sundays that we give towards the World Evangelism Fund, where we want to uh, give generously to ministries all across the world. And there's um, Easter just ends up being a great time to do that and say, yeah, we, we, we are excited. We have the good news. Um, we're telling the greatest story that's ever been told. And so part of how we do that is with our giving. So if you planned on doing that just because you remembered and knew that, that's great. Um, you can put those in the boxes at the back. You can give online or through the app at any time. If you didn't plan on that today, that's fine. We'll also take that offering up next week and then we'll send it in. But anything that comes in loose, if you don't put it in an envelope and you just stick it in there as cash in the back of the room as well, um, that'll go towards that offering. So I just want to encourage you to, to do that as we uh, worship together and giving, uh, being a part of that worship. Let me read to you from Isaiah 25 to start our service off this morning. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained and clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people will, take, will be taken away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Father, we come before you this morning just thankful for what you've done, thankful for what you're doing. We pray that everything that is said, everything that is um, uh, sung, and everything that is read, and all of the activities that we do this morning, Lord, would bring us closer to you. So would you reveal yourself to us in this time? Also, Lord, we just pray that you would receive it all as an offering of praise, and we trust you and thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I just want to invite you to kind of stand and greet those around you and prepare your hearts for what the Lord will do as we worship this morning.
Well, good morning. I invite you to go back to your seats at this time. I just have a couple of announcements as we get started today. Um, first of all, this is family worship for Easter. So if you are fifth grade and younger, I want to invite you to get a worship bag along the back wall. There's some activities and snacks and stuff like that for you to do during our service. Um, also, our nursery is open for three years old and younger down in our children's ministry hallway. So if you want to take advantage of that, please do so. Um, I just want to highlight some of the things we have going on every week at our church. Um, on Sundays, we typically have Sunday school that starts at 945, and then our worship service at 1045. Mondays, we have a small group that meets at 7 o'clock, and that is led by Pastor David. Wednesdays, we have dinner at 6 o'clock. It's always a fun time of fellowship, and then Bible studies start at 7, so don't miss Wednesdays. Thursdays, women's small group is at 11, and that is led by Nan Hayworth. They are about to start a new study on evangelism. So if that is interesting to you, please don't miss that as well. On Fridays, we have a couple things, men's breakfast. Um, there's some men that meet at the Brahms on Coulter at 8 a.m. So if you would like to go and join breakfast with some men, then go to that on Friday mornings. Um, primetime game night is at 5. So these are things that just happen every week. If, those, if any of those things interest you, please make a note of those and um, uh, find a time to attend. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is that if you know someone that could not be here today, if there's a shut-in, someone that's in the hospital, um, I would like for you to meet Barb Hobbs. And she will put together a flower arrangement for you to take with you, um, just so that we can make sure they know that they're loved, especially on this Easter Sunday when they couldn't get out. Um, but with that, that's all the announcements that I have today. So I invite you to stand as we go into a time of worship. Buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind away It was my doom Till I met
has risen. He has risen indeed. Let's give Jesus a big clap this morning. And a woo, 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 woo. Come on, don't hold back. It's Easter morning. Woo, woo. I have a word from God for the people of God this morning. Out of Matthew chapter 11. It says, come to me, all of you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take upon my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We want to invite anyone that, would, that is carrying a burden or whatever it may be with you this morning. This is a new year. This is the beginning of new something new. If, if you need to turn loose of that, if you need to get rid of that, this is the place to do that. Come. If that's Jesus this morning, start new. So during this next song, if you'd like to do that, please come and let's do that. Heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand.
of saying yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And Father, that we are your prized possession. And Lord, that you are the healer of all things. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we want to pray for our brother John Kelly this morning. Father, we lift him up to you. Lord, we know he's having some memory issues. But Father, I lift him up to you, Lord, this morning. We pray for that. You will just heal him, Lord, that you will restore that. And he can just remember things better. We also lift up Jerry Immel this morning. Father, he is a walking testimony of your healing power. Lord, we continue to pray for him for strength. And as well as Bobby, Bobby's having some hip issues. So, Lord, we, we pray for healing for both of them. Lord, we also lift up Neva's husband, Ron, this morning. Father, we know he's struggling with some heart issues and getting water on the lungs and what have you because the heart, the heart is not working properly. So, Father, we, we pray for healing there. But Lord, also pray for the doctor's eyes to be open and for him to get the help he needs. Father, we also lift up our sister Loretta Martin this morning. Father, again, she's having uh, memory issues. So, Father, I just pray that you remove the cobwebs, so to speak, Lord, and just just help her be able to remember things uh, that she needs to. We also lift our sister Betty Betty Gollyhue up to you this morning. Uh, Father, we know she has some health issues. Lord, we just pray that you will just continue to have your hand on her, which we know you will. But Lord, I lift her up to you this morning. Father, we also want to lift Drake and Grace Hollenbeck up to you this morning. This young couple who are preparing to come here to be our youth minister. Father, we we know that that is something that you've anointed, I'm sure of. And Father, that they're preparing for that. And, and Lord, we're ready. So, Father, we pray for that couple this morning. Lord, I also lift up George Morton to you this morning. Lord, he's struggling with his eyesight. Went to the doctor and got some glasses, but they're not quite what he needs yet. So, Father, I pray that you will just continue to open doors there for him and get him where he can see like he needs to. Father, we also lift up Brother Dale Ferris to you this morning. Um, Just health issues, strength, and memory. Lord, just pray that you will touch him at this very moment. Father, also lift up Tommy Sharp to you this morning. Um, Lord, I was visiting with his wife this morning and complained about his breathing, and he just seems to be struggling horribly bad. So, Lord, I pray that the doctor's eyes will be opened and medicine will be found to help with that situation. Lord, because he, he, he needs to be able to go. He does so much good for the church. So, Father, pray you be with him today. We also lift up our sister Linda Gaskell this morning. Uh, Father, for strength and balance. So, Father, we pray for that. Also, Charlie Rogers. Don't know exactly what's going on, Lord, but we just lift him up to you, Father. You know what he needs. So, Father, we pray for him this morning. Father, I also want to pray for Pastor Gavin this morning. Uh, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And I pray your anointing will be on him this morning, Lord, as he brings a message. Father, we thank you. You're so good to us. It's in your name we ask this. Amen.
Would you bless the praise of your people and the reading of your word this morning? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. He is risen. Amen. Um, you know, I, I uh, wanted to give you guys the Sunday off and not make you do notes if that's something you normally do. So if you're looking desperately through the app for notes... Uh, you'll just, they're not there. So don't, don't keep looking too long for that. Um, you know, typically uh, pastors like to preach long on special Sundays, but with all the stuff, extra stuff we do, it ends up being shorter. Um, with that said, there are no promises made, but this message was designed to be shorter this morning, just in light of communion and, 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 and baptism and other things. But... Um, Entitled this message "The Nonsense of the Gospel," and and that sounds it sounds a bit offensive. We when we normally when something we hear we don't like we say that's nonsense, or if we we hear something we don't understand well or we think it's not put together well we we say that's nonsense. But recognizing the connection there between uh, kind of that off-putting feeling, I still chose the title "The Nonsense of the Gospel." 
And that's because there are some things that just don't make sense to us when we try to use our, our intelligence. There's some things that don't register right, and so we, we think about them and we struggle with it. If you've ever had to learn a language, and even, even if you remember back to your school days and you're trying to learn Spanish or sign language or French or German or whatever you had, uh, the state of Texas told you you had to learn and was available to you, um, you ever, you ever got a, I mean, as you're supposed to translate something and you look at it and you say, this is, this is nonsense. What am, I, what am I supposed to understand with this? A favorite phrase when we were studying Greek in college was, well... <laughs> I don't understand this. It's all Greek to me. And all the pastor nerds laughed uh, whenever you would say, it's all Greek to me uh, while studying Greek. Um, for me, probably chemistry is the closest subject. Sorry for our chemists out there, but chemistry was the closest subject where I looked at this and I said, I don't know about this stuff. This, this is nonsense. And the truth is that for many people around the world, their, their separation, their barrier, the reason that they don't have a relationship with Jesus is based on the fact that they hear the story of the resurrection, the story of, of the birth of Jesus and then his death and resurrection. They say, you know, I can't accept that. That's nonsense. That's not what science tells us or experience tells us. And so we reject those things. I hope to be able to speak to that a little bit this morning. Also, as opposed to nonsense, a, 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 a little bit different way of looking at some of what happens throughout our life is, is maybe what happens when tragedy strikes. And it's, we don't have a clear path forward. And we might say, this is, this is nonsense. Or at least if that phrase doesn't come out, we'd say, I don't know what to do now. I don't know what to trust. Everything is changing around me. If you remember where you were on 9-11, and, and what, what was happening, what was going on, and how that changed, and the fear that arose, and, and the different things that were going on, how life was changing, and just said, man, I don't know a way forward. I don't understand what the Lord's going to do. Or a surprise illness of a member in your family, or, or maybe even the collective illness that we all struggled through together with COVID, and wondering, what's life going to be, be like now? I'm sorry for the cough. I, I, I've been dealing with that for a while, and I've been to the doctor, and it's it's only a problem if I try to say something. So just keep growing with it and I'll keep doing my best. But I'm sorry that you're having to listen to that this morning. So what do we do? Where do we go? What can be said for, for the difficulties that arise or for our, our hard time understanding how can God really redeem this situation in my life? I don't have a relationship with him. I don't know him. I've never given that a chance because I don't understand how I think things in my head or I speak them out loud and, and God as a being some other place understands that. I don't buy that, so I don't pray. I don't, I don't love him the way that, that he loves me because I, I, I have a barrier to that. I just can't understand how that could be true. How could God do that? And then how could Jesus rise from the dead? That doesn't happen. So our big idea for today, and again, you don't have any notes, but if you're just remembering one thing, maybe it would be this. The people of God are not called to enlightenment or perfect knowledge. The nonsense of the gospel is that we are called to a relationship with the Father despite all of our failures, despite all of our frailties. And just, the, just because something doesn't make sense to us right now doesn't mean that it never will. And just because something seems difficult for us to understand doesn't mean that it'll always be something that, that we struggle with. And so, yeah, people have had <laughs> barriers to accepting Christ, which include the Immaculate Conception, the Resurrection, uh, divine healings. Um, these things are nonsense. So what if we just trusted God? What if we said, God, I'm, I'm going to dive into this. I'm going to trust you to... to, to to cast out doubt, or even better yet, what if we just embraced it? What if we embraced the fact that I'm not smart enough to read in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and, and all the regular languages or all the, the original languages? 
I'm not smart enough to, to understand all the mysteries of the Trinity and, and how God is separately God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, and yet I still trust that that is one being working for my good and wanting to have a relationship with me. What if I just said, I accept all the nonsense, or what feels like nonsense, I cast out all the doubt, and even if I have to fake it for a while, what if I just said, I'm going to devote my life to this? Would God not do something in you? Would God not reveal something to you? And the nonsense would begin to come, become clear, begin to make sense to us. Let's read our nonsensical story for today from Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all the things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over it, he saw the, stripes, the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of God for God's people this morning. I think um, one of the first recorded instances in history of men just not listening well is this passage. The women come back and they relate to them what happened and they say, you know, I don't really, I don't really think that's true. But to be fair, in that place, in that time, in that custom, in that culture, men were considered more reliable witnesses. Women, they weren't allowed to be educated. Women did not have places of leadership and authority. And so when a woman came and gave a, a testimony, uh, it was not really necessarily considered believable. Um, adding to that the issue of the fact that uh, women were largely considered, uh, largely considered second-class citizens. And sometimes, if the law wasn't interpreted correctly, they might have even been considered something like property. And so hearing these words from these women, uh, trusted women uh, by any other means, uh, any other measure, uh, the men just didn't believe it. And again, if a group of people came and told you something nonsensical, men or women didn't matter today, you'd say, I'm not sure I believe that. It's kind of like if you have a toddler in your home or you've ever been around toddlers and they come and they tell you this big long story about something that happened, and you say, oh, wow, that was great. But you don't necessarily believe it. And unfortunately, women had a similar standing in society. And so it was understood that, yeah, they couldn't really be trusted. So they didn't even want to go back and check. Just Peter runs back in this telling. In, uh, in, other, in other scriptures, uh, uh, Peter and John run back and um, they go and they want to verify for themselves. What did they see? So the male disciples had abandoned Jesus. They had denied him. One, one of them betrayed him. The other, another denied. Uh, they didn't stick around. They, they kind of dispersed. And, and it seems like they're gathered together. They're hiding. They got the doors shut. They got the windows closed tight. Maybe the lamps down low or off and they're hiding. Jesus has been crucified. He's been laid to rest. And we go into the Sabbath, and perhaps after the Sabbath, we're next. And so the women know where to find them. The women go to them. They tell them this story. So they hear the story. They think it's nonsense. And then Peter actually goes. He sees the cloths laying there. And these were the cloths that were strips of linen that would have been uh, wrapped around Jesus. And they see that laying there, and they say, you know, um, he says to himself, I don't understand this. 
It's not until he sees the risen Lord that he fully understands, and that's a, a story maybe for the weeks to come, but that he sees this and he's confused. And so I'm challenging us today, let's, let's put our hope in the nonsense. Let's put our trust in the nonsense. So as unreliable witnesses, according to culture and tradition, it is nonsense and even perhaps scandalous that the Gospels recorded women as the first witnesses to the resurrection. Sometimes we ask, well, should women be able to preach? Do we allow women to seek ordination and leadership in the church? And these are questions that, that take much longer than, than uh, I think that I, that I have to, to speak with you this morning. But the truth is, instead of trying to answer that in a direct way, the gospel just says, here's a story of women preaching. Here's a story of women who've been raised to leadership. And so if, if that was good enough for the gospel story, I think it's good enough for us too as a people. And so Peter has to go see for himself because he, he can't trust necessarily the women um, so the Christian faith, uh, despite uh, the, the, the newly blossoming and budding Christian faith, uh, despite uh, the, the Jewish culture they had come out of in the first century Palestine where they come from, um, despite those things, it values women, it includes women, it names women, and it tells their story and continues to do so throughout Christian history. So they are the example of faith, and they serve as role models even to men, or especially to men, in this story. Because remember, if... if if, you, if we try to imagine what it would have been like to be scared for our lives, Jesus has been killed, maybe we're next, and then boom, the door bursts open and, and someone tells us, Jesus is risen, you have to come see this. And then one out of every 11 of us decides, okay, I'll go verify this, and the rest of us kind of just sit back and say, aye, that sounds like a bunch of nonsense to me. Maybe these women are confused. You know how women get So we, despite whether you're a woman or you're a man, you're a Jewish background or a Gentile background, whether you speak English as a first language or as a fifth language or whatever case, whatever country you were born in, despite any of that or anything that we could use as separation for us, the truth is we are all recipients of the greatest gift that has ever been given, and that is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, if we believe and trust in him. So it is available to anyone and everyone, those who are outsiders in need of special help, those who are insiders and, and, and needing to be reminded of, of the, the love and the grace and the faith um, that's available to us, the hope that's available to us. So we put our hope in this gift of the resurrection. But I can't help but think that despite those who are here this morning and, 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 and those who are connected to a church in some way, there's many more out there who may not be connected to a church who feel like outsiders, who hear the nonsense but don't have the invitation to relationship, who are kept at arm's length sometimes from church and, and need to be encouraged and welcomed and invited in to allow the nonsense to become sense or become intelligence for them. And so... One of the responses to Easter is not just, is not just to stop at coming to church and, and worshiping, but to go out and continue to live as though Jesus is risen. And if I'm living as, Jesus, as though Jesus were risen, I'm sharing the story. I'm sharing the hope. I'm sharing the good news. And sometimes we push people away when we share our, our faith and we have to be, I guess, intelligent and careful about how we do that sometimes. And sometimes we have to take a risk. There's a, there's a pastor who one time said that when people were telling him, well, you've got this figured out, you, you, you've, been to all the, you've done all the studies, and you've, you've been doing this for a while, and you have authority and stuff, and so you can do stuff that we can't do. And his response was, I'm just a beggar, trying to show other beggars where I found food. And those words were written, I think, for the first time 75 years ago, and, and many Christians have kept that, and they, they repeat that as part of the, the, the sacrament for the Lord's Supper and sometimes the sacrament for baptism, and, and we're going to do both this morning. But what would it change in my faith? What would it change in my life if I recognize that, that I'm a beggar? I'm not special. I'm, I'm a person who's weak, a person who suffers, but I've received food someplace. 
The Lord has given me grace and hope and forgiveness and peace. And, and, and man, I'll, I, there's a whole lot of other people in my same situation that could sure use something else. That could sure use uh, uh, a good meal. So I want to encourage you to think of yourself as a beggar just trying to help other beggars find where you have found food. So is there, is the resurrection hope for you today? Is, is it just a, a, a regular story that we come and once a year, we know we're going to talk about at least once a year, multiple times a year, maybe. Is it hope for you? Is, it some, is there something that you don't understand about it? Is there peace that you're waiting for? Is there a part of your life that you're saying, I'm just waiting for this to be fixed, and when it's fixed, I can come to church. When it's fixed, I can devote my life to Christ. When I have complete knowledge that I don't have any more doubt, then I can understand the resurrection. Then I can understand the, the, the virgin birth. Then I can understand how I have a relationship with somebody who I don't see, who I can't physically stand in their presence. And at that point, we can proclaim hope. Hopefully we can proclaim hope amidst doubt and amidst hard questions. If we wait for our lives to be in order or for us to understand everything before we come to Jesus, we will be waiting forever. And maybe you're already, you've already come to Jesus, you already, you already come to church, and you've already said the prayers, and you've been to the altar, but if you wait to deepen your relationship with the Lord, if you wait to, to give more of yourself and of your time and of your energy and of your, of your finances, of your being, if you wait to do that until you have something fixed, you're going to be waiting forever. So don't wait. In just a moment, we're going to move into a time of baptism and a, and a time of uh, communion. And these are reminders to us that we are people who can receive. We can receive food regularly. We can ask for help regularly. It's not just one time in our life or several times throughout our lives. There's a lot more I could say. So what are the barriers that keeps you from that deep relationship or accepting Christ this morning? Is it what other people will think around you? Is it the details and the facts and the timetables and, and, and just questioning the science of it all? If you've ever visited, if you've ever had a chance to visit Rome, I want to encourage you to visit Rome. If you ever have a chance to visit the Middle East or Palestine, visit, visit that place in, in the Holy Land, do that. But you can get wrapped up in, this was the thing, and, and we found this thing. And, 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 you're, and you start to wonder, is this really true? Is this really the place? Is this really the, are these really the shackles? Or this really, and you start to wonder about all these things. And, and you start to say, hi, I, I just have doubt. And this is what, this is what happens for intelligent people like us. We, we doubt things that we, we don't necessarily have all the, the truth behind it. But what I want to encourage us to do is to take a step of faith. If you already know the Lord, I want you just to say, you know, I'm going to give up whatever I need to give up. I'm going to change whatever I need to change so that I can fully dive into that relationship. If you don't know the Lord and you're here this morning, I want to encourage you, just give it a try. Just give it a try for a while. See if the Lord doesn't speak to you. Fully join in. Fully immerse yourself. As you do in the waters of baptism, that's why we go all the way under and we come all the way back out because we are dead and alive again and we, we want to experience something new. And it's not until we fully uh, live into that that we can hope to see what the Lord might do. So just as a way of closing, I want to give a brief testimony. 24 years ago, I was in a car accident. And uh, my heart stopped beating multiple times, uh, waiting for surgery and in the helicopter and, and, and getting into surgery and waiting for that. And, and uh, had a lot of different, various small injuries and large injuries. And, and I, remember, I remember coming out of that experience and waking up and, and the confusion and things. And, and, and the first news that I heard was that... Uh, 
you're, you know, don't try to move, don't try to sit up, don't try to walk, don't try to do these things because your body can't possibly do that now. I just want to let you know you're going to, you're, you ought to be paralyzed for a good few weeks and months and you're going to be in the hospital for probably over a year and, and the people with your types of injuries usually um, will have some walking assistance the rest of their life. And I was 17 years old when they told me this. And as I began to say, I actually kind of feel good, and, and I, I, I actually you know, want to do stuff. And they said, well, um, okay, well, <laughs> if you think so, we'll help you sit up. I said, I think I can sit up by myself. So I had all this accident happen on a, this accident happened on a Sunday evening, and on Friday morning, I walked out uh, on my own two feet. And, they, and the doctor said, this is nonsense. And I've remembered that phrase in my mind, that medical science, people who may or may not have had a, a faith, they looked and they said, I don't understand. I have the data. I have the x-rays. I performed the surgery myself, and I do not understand what is happening in this case. And I know that for myself, I said, this is my aha moment. This is my big moment. This is now when I'm saying, I'm going to dive in. I was called to be a missionary from a young age, and I already had that, but I was not living a life of closeness to Jesus Christ. And I said, this thing, I don't understand either, but I'm going to dive in now and be involved. And I read my Bible, and I studied my Bible, and I spoke with people about who Jesus was, and I dove into my church, and I was involved in ministry, and I went on mission trips, and I did all these different things. And my life was changed when I was 17 years old because I had my aha moment. Sometimes we don't get those. We don't get the aha moment. We don't get that time when our life is in deep crisis or nonsense is, is, is staring us in the face. And so we go and we go through and we, we do a, a mediocre kind of thing as it, as, as it pertains to our faith. And I want to encourage you to not wait for your aha moment, but to jump in to make this that time. Um, AJ, would you go ahead and come forward? We're going to have a baptism this morning. We only have one person today, and you know, I couldn't help but think about the fact that as I was thinking about this, go ahead and come to this side here, AJ. Um, we have a clothing boutique in the back here. It's right through this door. If you have never been baptized, if you have, if, if you have been mediocre in your faith and you're like, right now, I don't see any reason why I can't be baptized, I want to encourage you just to come forward. I don't think that, I'm, I'm not, we're not going to do the, the pastor thing where we wait and say someone else is coming. And we'll just wait till somebody comes. We're not going to do that. But I don't want there to be any, any hindrance, any barrier. Someone will probably run back and grab a big robe or something from back there for you to dry off in or whatever you need. But if you've never been baptized and you're, you're like the Ethiopian eunuch that day who received the good news uh, and said, what's, what's there stopping me from being baptized there, hopefully there would be no barrier. And guess what? The water is warm. So is anyone like that who would say, man, you know, I've never been baptized. I kind of want to do that right now. All right. Good. Well, we'll just, um, we'll just uh, proceed as we had planned. Um, AJ is a, is a unique uh, example for us because um, AJ has been baptized before. And normally... In our tradition, we'd say we don't we don't baptize people multiple times, but um, AJ has prepared a, just a really brief uh, testimony of why um, he really felt like he wanted to be baptized this morning. And I think that um, given that circumstance, we said, "Yeah, let's do it." So AJ, um, I was going to say, "How did we? Where did we put the mic?" Just tell us a little bit of what the Lord's doing in your life. So I was first baptized about uh, maybe when I was about ten. But I had a lot of doubt throughout my walk, and eventually, two years ago, about two years ago, I left the faith. But I still believe there was some sort of divine presence, because I've experienced it before. Um, I went on with life, as I suppose most non-Christians do. I focused on, rather, I was just trying to do good and better myself. However, there's a problem with this. 
You don't have any forgiveness. You don't have any salvation for those things that you've done wrong. <clears throat> and, and I kept trying to figure out if what is said in the Bible about Jesus' sacrifice being actually for our salvation, trying to figure out if it's true. Until recently, the divine presence I'd mentioned earlier revealed himself to be the Christian God. Now I, do not do I, now, I do not believe that my disbelief was in vain. I believe that as we read in Romans 8, 28, that God turned it to good. And he used it to help me grow. Amen. He helped me to humble, he, he helped humble myself through that experience. And today I declare that I am no longer the lost sheep. And I will follow the shepherd through all walks of life. Amen. Let's, uh, let's uh, affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I need you to make your way up here. I know you might not like holding hands, but I'm going to help you do that there. Just come all the way down. Okay. So uh, baptism was a symbol from, from the early church way back at the beginning where they said that uh, this is a significant moment in the life of Christ and a significant moment in the life of believers. And it's one in which we affirm the faith that we just uh, read before. So AJ, do you affirm that faith? Do you endeavor to live your life uh, following Jesus for the rest, uh, you, the rest of your life following Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Then it is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you. We'll have the worship team come as, as they come to uh, prepare for communion. Don't want you to slip here. When I begin, Gavin asked me to do communion this morning, I begin to think of, about communion and just the order of it. And so I went and looked in our Nazarene manual at it. And this particular way it's arranged, Gavin and I were talking, it's probably 100 years old, maybe a little bit. I'm sure it's been revised a few times. Now, of course, you know, communion is way over 2,500 years old. But this particular part for me is I, I like history. And I thought it was interesting that it's that old. So here we go. Communion supper is instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his sufferings, his sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. 
that shows forth the Lord's death until his return. The Lord's Supper is a mean of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit. It is to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. All those who are truly repentant, forsaking their sins, and believing in Christ for the salvation are invited to participate in the death and the resurrection of Christ. We come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and be made one by the Spirit. In unity with the church, we confess our faith as Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And so we pray. Holy God, we gather at this your table in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who by your Spirit was anointed to preach the good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, set at liberty those who are oppressed, Christ healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners, and established the new covenant for forgiveness of sins. We live in the hope of his coming again. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and gave thanks, broke the bread and gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we are, as we are, we gather um, as the body of Christ to offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving. Lord, pour out your, your Holy Spirit on us and on these your gifts. Make them by the power of your Spirit to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make each one of us Christ, one with each other, one in the ministry of Christ through the world, until Christ comes in final victory. In the name of the Father, now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, would y'all please join in with me and repeat with me the Lord's Prayer this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I want to tell each of you that you are all welcome to the table this morning. Jill and I are going to make our way down to the front with this. Gavin and Tracy are going to be in the back. So if you, will, those of you in the back two rows will go to the back. And the rest of us of you make two lines. Please come and take a seat with us this morning.
Let me just say this um, benediction over you guys as you head out today. Um, I want to invite you to stand. <laughs> um, may you go now in his peace. May the hope of the resurrection be yours, and may you fully embrace the nonsense in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.